Welcome to episode 131 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folk Tales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we hear the tale of a fisherman lost in a storm who finds the mythical island of Odrost and befriends its strange and wonderfully generous inhabitants in the Isle of Odrost. Once on a time there lived at Vieiro, not far from Rost, a poor fisherman named Isaac. He had nothing but a boat and a couple of goats, which his wife fed as well as she could with fish leavings, and with the grass she was able to gather on the surrounding hills. But his whole hut was full of hungry children, yet he was always satisfied with what God sent him. The only thing that worried him was his inability to live at peace with his neighbor. The latter was a rich man, thought himself entitled to far more than such a beggarly fellow as Isaac, and wanted to get him out of the way in order to take for himself the anchorage before Isaac's hut. One day, Isaac had put out a few miles to sea to fish, when suddenly a dark fog fell, and in a flash such a tremendous storm broke that he had to throw all his fish overboard in order to lighten ship and save his life. Even then it was very hard to keep the boat afloat, but he steered a careful course between and across the mountainous waves, which seemed ready to swallow him from moment to moment. After he had kept on for five or six hours in this manner, he thought that he ought to touch land somewhere. But time went by, and the storm and the fog grew worse and worse. Then he began to realize that either he was steering out to sea, or that the wind had veered, and at last he made sure the latter was the case. For he sailed on and on without a sight of land. Suddenly, he heard a hideous cry from the stern of the boat and felt certain that it was the drang who was singing his death song. Then he prayed God to guard his wife and children, for he thought his last hour had come. As he sat there and prayed, he made out something black, but when his boat drew nearer, he noticed that it was only three cormorants sitting on a piece of driftwood, and swish, he had passed them. Thus he sailed for a long time, and grew so hungry, and so thirsty, and so weary, that he did not know what to do. For the most part, he sat with the rudder in his hand and slept. But all of a sudden, the boat ran up on a beach and stopped. Then Isaac opened his eyes. The sun broke through the fog and shone on a beautiful land. Its hills and mountains were green to their very tops. Fields and meadows lay among their slopes, and he seemed to breathe a fragrance of flowers and grass sweeter than any he ever known before. God be praised, now I am safe, for this is Udrost said Isaac to himself. Directly ahead of him lay a field of barley with ears so large and heavy that he had never seen their like. And through the barley field, a narrow path led to a green turf-roofed cottage of clay that rose above the field. And on the roof of the cottage grazed a white goat with gilded horns and an udder as large as that of the largest cow before the door sat a little man clad in blue, puffing away at a little pipe he had a beard so long and so large that it hung far down upon his breast. "'Welcome to Adrost, Isaac,' said the man. "'Good day to you, father,' said Isaac. "'And do you know me?' "'It might be that I do,' said the man. "'I suppose you want to stay here overnight.' <laughs> That would suit me very well, father, was Isaac's reply. The trouble is with my sons, for they cannot bear the smell of a Christian, answered the man. Did you meet them? Uh, no, I 
I only met three cormorants who were sitting on a piece of driftwood and croaking, was Isaac's reply. <laughs> well, those were my sons, said the man, and emptied his pipe. And now, come into the house, for I think you must be hungry and thirsty. I'll take the liberty, father, said Isaac. When the man opened the door, everything within was so beautiful that Isaac could not get over his admiration. He had never seen anything like it. The table was covered with the finest dishes, bowls of cream and salmon and game and liver dumplings with syrup and cheese as well. And there were whole piles of doughnuts and there was mead and everything else that is good. Isaac ate and drank bravely, and yet his plate was never empty, and no matter how much he drank, his glass was always full. The man neither ate much nor said much, but suddenly they heard a noise and clamor before the house, and the man went out. After a time, he returned with his three sons, and Isaac trembled inward as they came to the door. But their father must have quieted them, for they were very friendly and amiable, and told Isaac he must use his guest right and sit down and drink with them. For Isaac had risen to leave the table, saying he had satisfied his hunger. But he gave in to them, and they drank mead together and became good friends. And they said that Isaac must go fishing with them, so that he would have something to take with him when he went home. The first time they put out, a great storm was raging. One of the sons sat at the rudder, the second at the bow, and the third in the middle, and Isaac had to work with the bailing can until he dripped with perspiration. He sailed as though they were mad. They never reefed a sail, and when the boat was full of water, they danced on the crest of the waves and slid down them so that the water in the stern spurted up like a fountain. After a time, the storm subsided, and they began to fish. And the sea was so full of fish that they could not even put out an anchor since mountains of fish were piled up between them. The sons of Udras drew up one fish after another. Isaac knew his, Isaac knew his business, but he had taken along his own fishing tackle, and as soon as a fish bit, he let go again. And at last, he had caught not a single one. When the boat was filled, they sailed home again to Udrost, and the sons cleaned the fish and laid them on the stands. Meanwhile, Isaac had complained to their father of his poor luck. The man promised that he should do better next time, and he gave him a couple of hooks. And the next time they went out to fish, Isaac caught just as many as the others. And when they reached home, he was given three stands of fish as his share. At length, Isaac began to get homesick, and when he was about to leave, the man made him a present of a new fishing boat, full of metal and tackle and other useful things. Isaac thanked him repeatedly, and the man invited him to come back when the season opened again, since he himself was going to take a cargo to Bergen, and Isaac could go along and sell his fish there himself. Isaac was more than willing, and asked him what course he should set when he again wanted to reach Udrast. <laughs> All you need to do is to follow the Comorant when he heads for the open sea. Then you will be on the right course, said the man. Good luck on your way. But when Isaac got under way and looked around, there was no Udrast in sight. Far and wide all around him, he saw no more than the ocean. When the time came, Isaac sailed to join the man of Udras' fishing craft, but such a craft he had never seen before. It was two hails long, so that when the steerman, who was on the lookout in the stern, wanted to call out something to the rower, the latter could not hear him. So they had stationed another man in the middle of the ship, close by the mast, who had to relay the steerman's call to the rower, and even he had to shout as loudly as he could in order to make himself heard. Isaac's share was laid down in the forepart of the boat, and he himself took down the fish from the stands, yet 
He could not understand how it was that the stands were continually filled with fresh fish, no matter how many he took away. And when he sailed away, they were still as full as ever. When he reached Bergen, he sold his fish and got so much money for them that he was able to buy a new schooner completely fitted out with a cargo to boot, as the man of Udrast had advised him. Late in the evening, when he was about to sail for home, a man came aboard and told him never to forget those who survived his neighbor, for his neighbor himself had died, and then he wished Isaac all possible success and good fortune for his schooner in advance. All is well, and all stands firm that towers in the air, said he. What he meant was that there was one aboard whom none could see, but who would support the mast on his back, if need be. Since that time, fortune was Isaac's friend, and well he knew why this was, and never forgot to prepare something good for whoever held the winter watch when the schooner was drawn up on land in the fall. And every Christmas night, there was the glow and shimmer of light, the sounds of fiddles and music, of laughter and merriment, and of dancing on the deserted schooner. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.